around us and within us. But there are still great essential mysteries to be solved. Questions we ask ourselves about how the universe works and the future of mankind. In a few days, I'm planning to visit Stephen Hawking to ask him what he thinks of some of the big puzzles that face us all and find out what he'd like to ask me. For me, the essence of what scientists do is not maths or experiments, abstract thought, or even applying for research funding, but asking questions. Newton wanted to know why things fell to the ground. Darwin, why animals were different in different places. I'm on my way to talk to Stephen Hawking about some of the questions we are both still asking. I want to ask him his views on evolution. As a physicist, does he think that the origin of life on Earth is just a happy coincidence? The existence of the Earth and the properties that made it possible for biological life to develop depend on a very fine balance between the so-called constants of nature. If they were more than slightly different, either planets like the Earth would not occur, or the chemical processes necessary for life would not take place. One might take this as evidence for a divine creator, but an alternative explanation is what is known as the multiverse. The idea is that there are many possible universes. Only in the small number of universes that are suitable will intelligent beings develop and be able to ask the question, why is the universe so carefully designed? What happened before the Big Bang? What happened before the origin of space and time? In Newton's theory, time was separate from space and ran from the infinite past to the infinite future. However, Newton's theory was superseded by Einstein's general theory of relativity. This allowed the beginning of the universe to be like the South Pole, with degrees of latitude playing the role of time. Asking for a time before the beginning would be like asking for a point south of the South Pole. Can one assume that insects and bacteria will survive us? if our so-called intelligence leads us to destroy ourselves by nuclear war or other disasters. Yes, I think you've got an excellent point. Um, we happen to survive by our intelligence, and so we think that's the way you should survive. But from a bird's point of view, say a swift, they would think that flying is the way you survive. Eyes are said to have evolved some 40 times independently. Flight has evolved four times independently, but it looks as though intelligence, at least verbal intelligence of our kind, has only evolved once. And so that might suggest that it's a pretty esoteric way of surviving. It seems to work very well for us, of course, and we're doing very well, we're overpopulating the planet with it. But if we go too far with it and destroy ourselves and destroy much of life, then of course you're right that other ways of survival will take over, bacteria prominent among them. One can't help asking, why are you so obsessed with God? Well, um, I noticed that you brought up the question of God and I didn't. When you ended A Brief History of Time with For Then We Shall Know the Mind of God, I suspect that you were using God in a sort of Einsteinian sense, a euphemism for the mystery at the root of the universe, that which we don't understand. But most people use the word God for a person. God as an answer to scientific questions, then I think it is scientifically pernicious because it distracts people away from the, the hard work of answering scientific questions. It's just too easy to say, oh, God did it, therefore we don't need to answer the question. Looking to the future, do you think there will be scientific geniuses in a world of supercomputers? Our 
picture of the universe has been transformed by brilliant individuals like Newton and Einstein who have made great leaps in the imagination. Computers cannot make such leaps, so I think there will be plenty more Newtons and Einsteins in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. In the not too distant future, there are certainly going to be major problems. Problems about climate change. Problems about increasing density of population. There will be a problem too about power. How are we to generate power? Science will produce the answer. What the answer will be, I don't know. But I'm perfectly certain that it is science that will find it for us. We began this story in the 17th century, at a time of witchcraft and superstition. When Britain was just recovering from a bloody civil war. We've seen how a handful of men began by asking questions. What keeps the stars in the sky? What makes an apple fall? What invisible worlds exist on our skin? and under our noses. Their determination and curiosity brought science into being. In the 350 years since, British scientists have learned to picture the enormity of the universe. And they've split the atom. They discovered how to cross oceans and fly at supersonic speeds how to power turbines and light up cities. They've uncovered the greatest secrets of life and shown us just how astonishing the world is. Scientists have helped us live longer, healthier and more fulfilled lives than ever before. Above all, these men have changed our world forever. Indeed, they've made it what it is. They were often awkward and contentious characters. People who kept on asking questions and didn't settle for second-rate answers. Their stories explain why science is so important to us. You don't have to be the cleverest kid in class or go to a posh school to become a great scientist. And what is clear is that we need more men and women like them in the future not fewer. We hope that some of you watching now will take up this challenge and continue to ask the important questions.